All right. Uh, third John. Third John chapter. Well, there's only one. <laughs> One chapter, 14 verses, 299 words. First John. We'll start, not first John. Third John, chapter 1, verse 1. We'll start in verse 1. Oh, I'm going to let everybody get there because I'm going to have you compare something. I want you at the same time to read two passages. You're in third John. You've got two eyeballs, so make one of them look at 3 John and make one of them look at 2 John. Let's read both passages at the same time. The elder unto the... Now it changes. You saw when we covered 2 John, the elect lady and the elect sister and the children of them. Okay, now he's talking to an individual instead of a group, a family. He says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So he's talking to some individual here. And it's somebody who is, um, uh, he's well known for doing good things. He's a good guy. So it's a little different than what we saw in the second chapter. Um, uh, this is similar to Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 3. Luke 1, verse 3. Luke's writing, and he's writing this to an individual. The book of Luke was not written to the church. It was not written to a group of Christians or to... A, a following of Jews. It was written to an individual. Luke 1 verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophanus. Okay, that's an individual he's writing to. And he calls him most excellent. Now that could be a, um, a title because he's some kind of a political leader. But it could also just be that's how he's known. He's excellent. He's an excellent person. You find those, and as Christians, we should strive to be well-beloved and excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not a brute. <laughs> I mean, some people think that the meaner they are, the more spiritual they are. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make you more spiritual. <laughs> if you can be nice, be nice. <laughs> there's sometimes, there's some lines you can't cross. Don't let nice get in the way of truth. Never. But don't be mean just because you've got an opportunity to. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. Acts 1 verse 1. Acts is the sequel to the book of Luke. The former treaties have I made, O Theophanes, of all that Jesus began to do, uh, began both to do and teach. Okay, so those books are written to an individual that he thought was worthy of the information. The Bible tells us, Jesus says, don't cast your pearls before swine. So whoever this was, Luke had a high opinion of him, and he was giving him all the details. Now, if the person was no good to begin with, he would have been casting his pearls before swine to just give him all of this deep information. John is saying the same thing about this guy in 3 John. He's well-beloved. He's commending him. Look at, uh, uh, I'm about to say chapter 1. There's only one. Verse 2. 3 John, verse 2. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Okay, he's already said he's well-beloved. That's for spiritual reasons and for his uh, personality and the things he's known for, his charity. Now he's saying, your soul's doing great and we all know that. And he's saying, if I was going to give you a wish, <laughs> and I don't mean it like some mysticism, but his desire is that he is in health and that... Um, 
that he be prosperous even as his soul is. His soul's already there, but his finances ain't. <laughs> now, if he was supposed to be healthy, wealthy, and have long life, as proof he was a good Christian, verse 1 would have been wrong. The well-beloved. Okay. He's already doing well. Even though he's not obviously healthy and wealthy. That's what John is wishing for him. That's okay. You, I think God deprives us of some things. I don't mean deprives us, but makes us wait on some things. Because he wants us to ask for them. Okay? Ask for them. <laughs> and it also gives the rest of the body a reason to create a wish list for them. That's what John's doing. He's creating, you know, they do that on technology. You can go on and create a, a shopping list and call it a wish list and send the link to somebody. Okay, that's what John's doing right here. He's creating a wish list and he's going to send this to God. God, I wish that he was prospering and he was as healthy as his soul is. Okay, that's a good prayer for him. That's a nice thing to do. Now, problem is, the charismatics will tell you God's goal for you is to be healthy, wealthy, and have long life. And it may or may not be. But they'll use this verse in their prosperity gospel. And that's not quite so. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. First Corinthians three verse one. He says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto carnal, or as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. That is, we can't come in I couldn't come in here and have a real good spiritual conversation and discuss Bible like I wanted to, because you're so count carnal. Now, he didn't say they were carnal because um, they had backslidden into it. No, they hadn't grown out of it. <laughs> they were babies. <laughs> he says they're babies. But as unto babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto were you not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. Okay, so the very first thing that a, person, a baby learns is me first, me first. Isn't that what we all learned? Yeah. My toy. <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> okay, when you get saved, it's the same way. When you first get saved, you know what you think? God, do this for me. Fix this. And he did. Because you were a baby. Babies need that to develop. But pretty soon you should grow out of it. The charismatic movement has turned what could have been mature Christians back into babies because it makes them selfish and they think I can demand God give me wealth and good health and you can't Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians 4 verse 14 he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The problem with being a baby Christian and remaining on that level, it's fine for a baby to be a baby, but you know what I mean. You need to grow out of it at some point. <laughs> and if you don't grow out of it, chances are you'll be deceived. They say, they talk about something being easy to do. They say it's like taking candy from a baby. No, it's not easy to take candy from a baby. It's sweet. They love it. That's a hard thing to do. It's like taking broccoli from a baby. Okay? <laughs> Babies naturally crave the wrong things. Spiritually, it's the same. As soon as you get saved, we naturally think... Okay, God's going to make everything perfect for me. Mm, well, okay, you can think that for a while. And he does do a lot of great things for us. I'm not saying he doesn't. 
But at the same time, he's not there uh, to cater to your wants. What he's interested is in the thing that's going to be with him for eternity, and it's not going to be your flesh. Why would he waste a lot of time and energy on something he's going to destroy? Your body. <laughs> it's going back to dirt. <laughs> he's going to blow it apart, put the molecules back in a supernatural way. So it doesn't really do a whole lot of good for him to give you health. He's going to have to kill you anyway one day. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the charismatic doctrine has this train of thought. If you're spiritual, you have the apostolic signs. That is, you can work miracles and do wonders and all this stuff. And you'll be healthy and you'll be wealthy. Now, that was a promise in the Old Testament. And for a while, the apostolic signs were around because there were apostles. There's no more apostles. So why would we still have their signs? Who would be doing it? You would be an apostle if you could do the apostles' signs. There are no more apostles. There was 12 of them. No more. They died. They're gone. <laughs> now, this is a, a false movement the charismatics have built. So with a false movement, you've got to turn it into a business. It's a fact. That's why it's so dangerous for good Bible-believing churches to become money-hungry. Because that can turn into a business. We're not here for business. We're here for spiritual nourishment the multi-level marketing plan that they have is this uh, you will get wealth and you will get health if you put some money in my pocket and they call this a little phrase plant a seed of faith that ain't a seed of faith that's a seed of coin <laughs> but you see how they automatically start switching things they take a spiritual and turn it into physical. Okay? If they said a seed of faith, then why did they say my faith was a coin? Does that mean the more coins I have, the more faith I have? <laughs> okay, the logic is off. Look at Acts 19. Yes. <laughs> and she was telling me all about seed, faith, giving. Why don't you give God will multiply and give back? And I said, Oh, and I didn't know enough about it. I was interested in it. But the scriptures they gave me didn't say that. So I was kind of confused about that. Yeah. Plant a seed of faith. <laughs> <laughs> Acts nineteen eleven he says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Okay, so there's the apostolic signs. See, even there, the apostolic signs were not the apostles. They were gods. That's right. God wrought mighty miracles and let it come through the hands of Paul. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, he says this, To another faith by the same spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Okay, there's where he's talking about those signs that God gave out. Those signs were for the apostles but not for all the church members. <laughs> and obviously those things ceased because Paul was sick. Why couldn't he heal himself? Paul's eyes were bad. How come he couldn't heal his own eyes? Okay, so those things came to an end. The signs were given for Israel to show Israel that God was working in this manner with this group of people. That's the way he began the nation was by signs. The fact of the matter is, Paul wasn't ever really healthy. I mean, maybe he was as a young man, but pretty soon he becomes old and feeble. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. God's commentary, when Paul complains about it, God did not say, you don't have enough faith. God didn't say, go down to the new faith healer that I'm using. He says this, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, not the healing line. <laughs> Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Well, I thought we were supposed to be healthy. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. If you had to trade your health 
for the power of God, which would you choose? Paul said, I'll take the power of God any day. And he didn't say that flippantly. He really was, he says right here, his infirmities, sick. Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 14. Paul's testimony about himself. In my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected, but ye received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. That is, uh, his, his flesh was weak. He was uh, a feeble old man. He's calling that his temptation. Sure it is. It's his temptation to quit. We've all got a temptation. He says in Hebrews, lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us. Some things are weights and some things are sins. Okay, everybody's got a weight that'll easily beset them. <laughs> Colossians 4.14, it says this, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. You know what Paul did? He didn't take a faith healer with him. He took a doctor on his journeys. He said, the physician, I got him with me. Well, I've told you many times, I'm a sick man. I got me a doctor on staff. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Okay, the charismatics have not read far enough. <laughs> First Tim or Second Timothy four. Second Timothy four verse eleven. You almost feel sorry for Luke. Luke has to follow Paul everywhere. This shows you how sickly he was. Only Luke is with me. I've been everybody's had their turn and gone, but I'm making Luke stay because he's a doctor. Okay, it's clear. Philippians 3, verse 10. Philippians 3, 10. Paul's been suffering this way for many, many years. And finally he says, I've just got to get down to you know, understanding this thing and putting a theory behind it. Here it is, Philippians 3, 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. He said, he died for me, and I'm supposed to consider this body dead to sin. All he's doing is he's making it apparent to me that I really am dead to sin. <laughs> he said, this has become my object lesson. I've become conformable to his suffering. He suffered on that cross to die for our sin. Paul said, it's become a vivid picture in my life. Uh, when a half-truth is sold as a complete truth, it becomes a complete falsehood. <laughs> if you get priorities wrong, it's very dangerous because then it's all wrong. They have, especially biblically. Biblically, you have to have the same priorities that God intends. He calls that um, inordinate, meaning out of order. Look at... Um, Mm, I didn't give you the verses there. Um, I'm going to show you some areas where the charismatics hold this train of thought. I'm over-teaching this subject, I know. You all already know it, but I'm going to give you all the scriptures for it. In case you encounter it. Acts, or not Acts, Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. Acts 8, verse 17. This is usually where a charismatic is going to teach the healthy um, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Are you Matthew? Matthew, chapter 8, verse 17. They're going to go here and they're going to take this verse and they're going to say that if you got saved, you got health. And here's what they say, verse 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah, but it's Isaiah, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Okay? You don't bother looking for it in Isaiah because the Bible didn't say that Isaiah wrote it. It says Isaiah said it, which was spoken by Isaiah. Isaiah says something similar, but not those words. 
Therefore, he spoke this. He didn't write this. What he wrote was similar. Okay, so notice the verse. He bare our sicknesses. So, charismatic will come along and say, God took sickness away from you. Why do you have it? You must have an evil spirit of sickness. <laughs> no faith. That's right. Okay, so let's investigate this passage right here. Because if he brings up this verse, the charismatics brings it up to you, you need to know how to explain it to him properly. So the easiest way to explain the passage is stay right in the passage. I know that we can flip to a hundred different verses, but you're probably not going to remember them. And you're, you're probably not going to have access to your notes, but I want to show you usually the Bible clears itself up with its own context. So notice, when does this healing occur? Let me ask you, just off the top of your head, was this before Jesus died or after he died? Obviously before. It's in chapter 8 of Matthew. <laughs> We're still at the beginning. Okay, so... He himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Where and when? Charismatic's going to tell you on the cross. Jesus wasn't on the cross right here. So that doesn't apply. Hmm. Well, let's see what he did and who this whole thing's talking about. Verse 2. Matthew 8, verse 2. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Okay? He's physically sick. He's a leper. <laughs> he says, God, you can fix this and I know it. And he did. Okay, so a leper is a fitting uh, typology, a picture for the nation of Israel because they were lepers. They had infected themselves with sin and that's something only God can get rid of. Okay, so that's a good way for him to begin his ministry and that's what he does. Uh, look at Isaiah 1. Isaiah 1 verse 5. God talking to the nation of Israel. Isaiah 1 verse 5. Why should be, you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. And the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Okay, so as a nation, they were sick. So the first thing he does is he heals a leprous man. Physical sickness that at that time was no cure for. Well, he's got the cure. As a nation, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, had the cure, but they wouldn't accept it. Okay, the next time this happens, same chapter, Matthew 8, look at verse 10. So we begin with a leper. Don't know if he's a Jew or a Gentile. More than likely, he's a Jew. Gentile probably would not, um, well, he would have probably been um, outcast. We know that it could have been either, but obviously he's a leper. The next one is in verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in, in Israel. All right, this is a centurion who comes to him and says, uh, My boy is sick, heal him. Okay, is he a Jew? Obviously not. But he's obviously a proselyte. He's someone who's following the Jewish faith. Let's find it before you just think I'm making something up. Luke chapter 7. <laughs> Luke 7 verse 2. And a certain, centuri uh, certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. Verse 5. For he loveth our nation and he hath built us a synagogue. Okay, he's obviously a proselyte. He loves the Jews. He wants to do them well. And he's participating. In the tribulation, that's going to apply. If you're a Gentile, the only way to get in is become a proselyte. Okay, but let's keep on. Matthew chapter 8. Next time this happened, it, it, verse 14. 
Matthew 8, verse 14. This is a Jewish woman, obviously. <laughs> and when Jesus was come in into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. Okay, so Peter's uh, mother-in-law. And he, uh, this is why Peter denied Jesus, because he healed his mother-in-law. <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> The mother-in-laws get a bad rap. I don't have any problem with mine. Heard somebody else say this was the low point. Right. So obviously that's a Jew, and he's healed this woman. So he's shown us the leper. He's got the power for a proselyte. He wants to heal them, and it's not limited to men. He's got a woman in here too. Okay, and this is all before the cross, so it doesn't apply in our age. But I wonder. How were they healed? Because according to the charismatic, the way you're healed, put some money in my pocket. Or come to my meeting, give me a big crowd, and be my follower. You know, I need 45,000 follows on my Facebook, or whatever it is. Instagram. Instagram. Matthew 8, look at verse 16. And when even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirit with his word, and he healed all that were sick. Okay, you notice the ones who are sick there have a problem, an evil spirit. And it takes one thing to get rid of the evil spirit, the word of God. Okay, nobody's uh, anointing them with special oil. Nobody's sending them a prayer rug. <laughs> it's the Word of God doing it. And the reason is because they have evil spirits. Now, the fact of the matter is this. You can get all kinds of things that an evil spirit will give you. Sometimes, it is a health thing. And in this case right here, he was saying he cast out demons, and that was making them unhealthy. Well, everybody who's messed up with satanic things is unhealthy. You Watch the druggies. You ever seen a healthy druggie? Okay, that's demonic. Those, I saw a thing where um, Lady Gaga was leaving London. And she is as possessed as the maniac of Gadara. She could barely move. She was like moving in slow motion. She was not there. The lights were on, but nobody had been home for years. <laughs> uh, there's something wrong with that woman. Bad wrong. If that's a... She did. That's why she was leaving. But that, there's... That's cuckoo. She's so possessed, it's crazy. But she doesn't look healthy either. Okay. So... Demonic things don't make you healthy. So that'll cause some sickness in you. But let's go on to the next verse, verse 17. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Okay, now we see sicknesses. What's that sickness in context? Verse 16, casting out evil spirits. That's the sickness he was taking care of. It wasn't the sickness of uh, bad nutrition. It was the sickness of evil spirits. And that can only be handled by the word of God. Okay, so how did this change? Did, did something like this happen after the cross? Because they'll find a verse that will work after the cross. Once you show them this passage doesn't apply because Jesus hadn't borne our infirmities yet. He hadn't been to the cross. Then they'll run you here, 1 Peter 2. First Peter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. There's the cross. That we, being dead to sin, should, not live, uh, should live unto righteousness. Here's the phrase. By whose stripes ye were healed. Okay, there it is. Healing. You shouldn't be sick because on the tree he took all the things that would make you sick. And so now... 
he had stripes, so you get healing instead. The context is talking about sins. It's talking about righteousness. That's right. It's talking about health. That's right. It's a different kind of sickness, and it's a different kind of healing. Look at Second uh, Corinthians five. No, not here. Well, yeah, he, he could be talking to the Jews here. But that you could apply that here because he did do this on the tree, that is on the cross, and he did what he did on the cross affects me. Second uh, Corinthians 5. Here's what he really did on the cross that gave us healing. Second Corinthians 5:21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The difference is sin versus righteousness. That's the healing we got, was righteousness. And everything to do with your health. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 4. This is as close as we can come to... Um, saying this is a quotation from uh, Matthew 8. This is not the quotation, but it's close. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Very clear in that passage is nothing about health. Notice what you get healed from. Verse 5, transgressions and iniquities. That's the healing he's referring to. It's 100% spiritual. It's 100% talking about sin. Um, the problem with taken the charismatic viewpoint is this once you connect physical healing with salvation then the person gets sick they suddenly think I lost my salvation you can't connect those two yeah that won't work fact of the matter is physically we're going to be 100% healed one day but our salvation is not complete until the millennium. Until the second advent, we don't get everything that is promised to us. One day we're going to get all of it. We'll never be sick again. We'll be immortal. Okay, but we don't have that right now. That's a promise given to us. Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11 verse 4. It says, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Wicked are gone. Verse 6. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Don't try it now. <laughs> and the leper shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and the child shall lead them. Okay, don't send your kid out there trying to do that right now. It's not going to work out too well. But one day it will. So just because something has been promised to us does not mean the timing means you can have it right now. <laughs> you go to college with the promise of one day you'll get a diploma. <laughs> doesn't mean just because you enrolled you automatically get one. And it doesn't mean that if you fail, you'll still get it. <laughs> you may have paid more than full price. But you won't get that diploma if you don't pass. <laughs> okay, we've been promised a lot of things. Doesn't mean that we can demand it right this minute. And that's what the charismatic does. He takes a promise that's been promised you in the future and demands it right now. One day you will be 100% healthy and never have a day of sickness again. You'll be 100% whole, but not right now. Charismatic will stomp his feet and say, I demand it right now. And God will say, it's not time. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm just that word, demand. I hate that. Yes. Like Declare and decree. decree. Yeah. 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 
the, the fact of the matter is God created this body out of the materials that he cursed. So we bear in our bodies a curse. I can see that. He didn't remove that until he removes this body. He's going to give us a new one that has no curse associated with it. And until he does, even your blood has a problem. Everybody's blood causes them to get sick. One day we'll have perfect blood, like him, but not now. It's coming. Um, and I got a lot more verses on that, but we're going to skip them. I think that's gone far enough. Whoa, whoa, over far enough. We'll pick up verse 5 next week.